just that it's a very nostalgic setting for my guest today, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Welcome to Walk the Talk. And interesting to have you here in Delhi School of Economics where you taught for three years. And I think a, a whole lot of people you taught have then gone on to run India's economic policy, corporations, so much. Well, I have very fond memories of having been a teacher in the Delhi School of Economics. I think some of the most valuable friendships of my life were made during this period. Professor A.K. Sam, Professor Sukuma Chakravarti, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati, and whole generation of younger economists who have since then made phenomenal contribution to the... In fact, you've brought many of them into, in, into the policy structure. Many of them have then run India's economy. Well, yes, I think uh, Bimal Jalan was one of the persons I picked up for the Ministry of Finance when I became Chief Economic Advisor. Monte Kaluvalia was another uh, distinguished economist whom I brought to the government. Rakesh Mohan is yet another distinguished e person whom I Who's brought to the Who's now Deputy Governor, Deputy Governor, Deputy Governor of the yes. Reserve Bank. And even among the IAS, I think I picked up a large number of talented young people to work for me when I was in the Ministry of Finance. But Dr. Singh, tell me something. Economics you taught here between 69 and 71, before that in Punjab University at Oxford, and later lecturing on commerce and trade. It was very different from the economics you practiced when you became finance minister. Well, times have changed. In the 50s and 60s, there were very few people in the world, including people in the West, who differed uh, from what India was trying to do. Those were the days of Rostov's takeoff into self-sustained growth. But all that you need for an economy to take off was a large dose of public investment and thereafter the economy will look after itself. We had, I think, in the late 50s, an MIT project. The MIT people were closely involved in planning of economic policy in India. And there was no difference between our planning commission and the advice, that, uh, advice that came from distinguished economists of the MIT. I think. Well, that was sort of East Coast academic advice because the US economy was going at, uh, taking a different direction. Well, I think obviously nobody would say that India's problems are the same as the problems of the United right. States. I think that was the period when most people believe that in developing countries, because of the lack of adequate development of the entrepreneurial skills, private sector limitation, public sector had to be the lead. But sector. sir, when did you realize that this had changed? That maybe maybe some of what had been taught to you or some of what you had taught was if either a myth or that times had left it behind? No, it was not a myth. Uh, I think I believe what India did in the 50s and early right. 60s uh, laid the foundation of what has happened to India since then. Right. If Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru had not invested in modern temples of India, the massive irrigation yes, project, the public sector investment in steel, the institutions of higher learning, the Department of Atomic Energy, space program, India would not be able to reap the benefit of globalization which we are now able to claim in the changed environment of the world. Doesn't take me back to 1991, the summer of 1991. What exactly happened? You know, the, when, when you were actually in the hot seat. Well, uh, I had no indications that I would be called upon to become the finance ministers. I had come back from the South Commission, and India was then in crisis. Mr. Chandrasekhar was the prime minister. He asked me to help him as an advisor to the prime minister. I saw at that time that India was in the midst of a deep crisis and I started thinking what to do about it. In my convocation address at the Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, bef long before I became finance minister, I set out the elements of a stabilization, calm structural adjustment program, which I thought India needed. But I had at that time no indication. But sir, when did you realize that Indian economic thinking of, or you know the whole idea in the way India's economy was managed now had to make such a big turnaround? I, I, I want an about turn, but such a big change. Well, I was uh, convinced by the early 70s when I became chief economic advisor 
I think the first paper that I did for Prime Minister Indira Gandhi was what to do with the victory. And I, at that time I said that we had gone too far in imposing unrealistic control structure that liberalization of the private sector, liberalization was of the required. Economy, it was required. So you first recommended the end of license quota Raj, in, I, I in, in the I do claim early seventies. Early seventies. In fact, in the paper that I wrote was in nineteen seventy two. Right. And soon after, I think the gradual and, process of and, and you, but you got the chance of putting that into effect twenty years later. Well, I think I was a civil servant, I was um, chief economic advisor, I was also a secretary of economic affairs, then I became member secretary of the planning commission and people don't uh, remember, I was in, 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 one of the uh, persons who took part in the formulation of both the sixth and the seventh plan. And these were the only plans where the growth targets were more than fully impl but implemented. Sir, in 1991, when you took over, just describe the crisis to me. When you became finance minister, how bad were things at that point? Well, I believe we had uh, we, we had exchange, foreign exchange for not even for a week's imports. India's foreign exchange reserves had been exhausted. People who had lent money to Indian Indian banking system, they wanted their money money back. Right. And if we had gone that way, we would have to impose such drastic import control that there would have been unimaginable increase in unemployment, a sharp increase in inflation was already evident. When we came to office, prices were rising at a rate of about 20% per annum and our system does not tolerate high doses of inflation. And India would have gone into anarchy at that point. Yes, exactly. I think what we faced was a complete breakdown of the economic system of India. The type of things which happened in the Soviet Union, for example, or Eastern European and countries. How close were we to that? Well, we were very close to that. A few days, a few weeks? I think a few weeks, as I said, our foreign exchange reserves were no more than I think, one million, uh, one billion dollars. That is two weeks imports. Non-resident Indians who had kept money in our country were withdrawing their money. The Indian banking system had borrowed some short-term money from the uh, international banking system. Those bankers wanted their money back. The aid donors were not willing to give aid to India. Yishwan Sinha, uh, when he was um, finance minister, he went abroad for, to Washington, to Tokyo, but I think he drew complete blank. Nobody was willing to help. Nobody was willing to help India. So was that maybe was that the shock treatment we needed to to start changing? Well, maybe I think we are a democracy, but we are also an indisciplined democracy. A crisis concentrates the mind probably as nothing else. But when I became finance minister, in the very first week I said India is in the midst of a deep crisis. We are going to convert this crisis into an opportunity. So this crisis is almost, almost as, as serious as, as maybe the 62 war against China, when the country could have collapsed. Well, the country's economy would certainly have yes, collapsed sir. and the politics then could not also be saved. But would you say that this was the greatest period of the, of the greatest crisis in India's economic history, independent India's economic history? Or do you well, see any other moment that, that was comparable? Well, I think we had, I think, a crisis of the foreign exchange in 1957-58. Right. We had, I think, 62 events that you mentioned. But in terms of, I think, the consequences for managing the Indian economy, the 1991 crisis was probably the most severe crisis. Dr. Singh, tell me a few things you did at that point because, you know, your government had just come in, you had to get your vote of confidence, uh, you didn't have full majority, so what were the sort of emergency measures it took like, well, you know, the equivalent of pumping steroid and oxygen into a patient? Well, the first thing that I came to realize was that India's exchange rate had to be changed. Now, it was too high? Well, I think the rupee was un at an unrealistic level. We had to change the exchange rate. We had to depreciate the rupee. But changing the exchange rate in India has always been a political problem. Right. And here was a government which was a minority government. Here was a government which yet had yet to vote of, win a vote of confidence. I went to the Prime Minister and I said, we cannot wait till we get the vote of confidence. Because, because in India, the popular mind, we link the value of the rupee with national pride. That's exactly. So, I think the first thing that we did was to adjust the exchange value of the rupee in two doses. Now, I had to do that because there were difficulties in going for the straightforward way. Right. But 
What is the straightforward way? The straight Announcing a devaluation. Devaluation, but I think cabinet would, was not prepared. Right. There was opposition from the president. He said, "Well, you don't uh, have a government which, uh, ha which which has yet to win a vote of confidence." So how this can you, Ven uh, Mr. Venkatraman? Mr. Venkatraman. Yes. So we found a way out. I instructed the Reserve Bank to announce a new intervention rate. After a few days, I asked them to repeat it. And the result is we brought about a devaluation, a depreciation of the Indian rupee. Without, without announcing a devaluation? Without, about 25 percent. So The world got a message that here was a government which, despite being a minority government, was able to take the first decision. So and if you remember that the decision to adjust the exchange rate in the 1960s, I think the decision could not be taken over a period of three years. This the is early 60s. Early 60s. All these decisions in the past... Until Muraji Desai came, I think, and... Uh, no, I think the, the World Bank had proposed the depreciation of the Indian rupee in 1962. Ultimately, it was done in 1966. Right. In between, there was tensions within the government. The government was not able to take decision. But within 10 days of the Narsim Rao government, we took some of the most difficult decisions. Take, for example, the adjustment of the industrial licensing policy. Right. We abolished the license permit raj within one month of our government. And I was able to report in my first budget speech that India had now a different... Now, now was there a signal you were giving to Indian businessmen or, both, or, or, or to international lenders both, and institutions? Both to Indian businessmen and to international creditors. Right. I think we wanted a, a regime which would value enterprise, which would value risk taking and we wanted to cre uh, create an environment in which even the foreign investors would have confidence that India now welcomes So tell me investors. something about your exchanges with Mr. Narsim Rao. Uh, did he understand the need for change economics because both of you were brought up in a socialist milieu? Well, Mr. He more than you. Well, Mr. Narsim Rao was most supportive. Without his active backing, I could not have done anything. But he knew, the, he knew the risks. Well, he knew the risk and he told me that if the thing succeeds, we will all claim credit. If the things don't work, well, you will be <laughs> sacrificed. And I was prepared for that. So, so, you, so you're marked out as a likely scapegoat if this yes, happened? Yes, I think I realized that right, right from the beginning. Were there moments when you had doubts, when you thought this can go wrong or this is going wrong? Well, I, I had some doubts when I presented the first bu budget. Right. We had, I think, cut subsidies very sharply. In right. fact, in my very first budget, in the history of India, this has never been done. We adjusted, we reduced the fiscal deficit of the central government by full two percentage point of the GDP. Right. This has never happened. Never happened. Before, this has and, never and, and happened. And that brings its own pain. And we, therefore, we adjusted food subsidies, we adjusted fertilizer subsidies. But then there was pressure from parliament and the government developed cold feet and at that stage I protested and I gave my resignation to the Prime Minister. I said, if you are going to go this way, then I am not able to, I think, sir. So either, either follow your convictions and, and the path of but, reason or forget it. But I must say that Mr. Narsim Rao backed me to the hilt, I think, in the first two years but, of our government. Sir, there are those who say that this was like <laughs> Dr. Manmohan Singh's re-education. He, he learned and taught something else all his life. He was a socialist. And then when crisis came, he made a complete turnaround. Well, let me say, I have been always a socialist in the sense that I regard a quest for equity, quest for social equality as fundamental to running a modern economy and modern society. If by socialism you mean a passion for equity, a passion for equality. I am a socialist even then. But I have never been a, a socialist in the sense, in the doctrinal sense of the term, so, that all things must be done by the government. So are you a socialist now or not? I am a socialist in the sense I, that I worry about growing inequalities. I worry about the fact that millions of our children coming from poorer, uh, poorer families are outside the school system, that millions of our families do not have access to safe drinking water.